Sixty days ago, Tom was an easygoing, laid-back kind of guy. Nothing seemed to faze him. While others complained about the storm clouds threatening their lives, Tom seemed to live in his own personal bubble of sunshine. But 50 days ago, Tom started having bad headaches. All day, every day. Twenty days ago, worn out from the pain, lack of sleep, and inability to think straight, he went to his doctor about the problem. The doctor examined him and concluded the migraines might be due to an allergic reaction. He suggested some changes to Tom's diet, which Tom followed, but the headaches got worse. Ten days ago, Tom had to take a leave of absence from work. For days, he lay in his bed in the dark, trying not to move or think. One day ago, with no food left in the house, Tom tried to go to the store, but he passed out in the middle of the kitchen floor. When he woke up three hours later, he called 911. The ambulance arrived and hurried him to the local hospital. One minute ago, Tom got the results of the extensive tests from the last 24 hours. As he sat there, alone in the pre-op room, he was anything but cool, calm, and collected. In a few minutes, an orderly would be arriving to wheel him off to the operating room. There, a team of neurosurgeons would try to remove a cancerous tumor from his brain. The doctor had indicated they had less than a 30% chance of removing all the tumor. And even if they did, he said, it was likely that Tom would have some motor skill damage as a result of the operation. The easygoing, carefree guy had disappeared completely. What had once been calm waters and gentle breezes was now a perfect storm of raging currents and hurricane force winds. And the questions raced through Tom's mind. Why had this happened to him? Where was God in this dark and stormy time? And what hope did he have for the future? Perhaps you can relate to Tom's story. Life is humming along nicely when Bam, a number of crises occur all at once. A layoff plus a recession. A disease plus a job transfer. A relationship breakup plus a college rejection. You can handle one challenge, but two or three at a time? You're blindsided by an unexpected crisis that keeps getting worse and worse. You try to battle your way through, but keep getting knocked down by one bad event after another. Maybe you, like Tom, are wondering where God is in the middle of this terrible storm. Is he anywhere near? Will you even survive? Peter and the disciples could relate. When we read that they were caught in the storm on the Sea of Galilee, it's easy to overlook just how dangerous the situation was. Such storms in the region were akin to a sumo wrestler's belly flop on a kiddie pool. The northern valley acted like a wind tunnel, compressing and hosing squalls onto the lake. Waves as tall as 10 feet were common. This combination of high winds plus high waves made the situation treacherous. It was one thing for Peter and the disciples to battle the winds. That was enough of a challenge. But when you add the winds plus the waves, it was a recipe for disaster. Today, mariners might call such a tempest a perfect storm. Not perfect in the sense of ideal, but perfect in the sense of combining factors. Every element works together to create the insurmountable disaster. What's more, it's clear from Matthew's gospel the disciples battled the storm for some time before Jesus appeared. The disciples' journey began at nightfall. Jesus had performed the miracle of feeding the 5,000 earlier in the day and then had sent the disciples on ahead so he could spend some time in prayer. Meanwhile, the disciples were in trouble far away from land for a strong wind had risen and they were fighting heavy waves. When does Christ come to them? About three o'clock in the morning. 
If evening began at six o'clock and Christ came at three in the morning, the disciples were alone in the storm for nine hours. Nine tempestuous hours, long enough for more than one disciple to ask, where is Jesus? He knows we're in the boat. Is God anywhere near? It's the question we all ask when hit with the perfect storm. And Paul's answer to that question is concise and clear. The peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. As we do our part, rejoice in the Lord, pursue a gentle spirit, pray about everything, and cling to gratitude, God does his part. He bestows upon us the peace of God. Note that this is not a peace from God. Our Father gives us the very peace of God. He downloads the tranquility of the throne room into our world, resulting in an inexplicable calm. We should be worried, but we aren't. We should be upset, but we're comforted. The peace of God transcends all logic and scheming and efforts to explain it. This kind of peace is not just a human achievement. It is a gift from above. Jesus said, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Jesus promises you his version of peace. The peace that calmed his heart when he was falsely accused. The peace that steadied his voice when he spoke to Pilate. The peace that kept his thoughts clear and heart pure as he hung on the cross. This was his peace. This can be your peace. Paul tells us more about the peace of God. He says it guards our hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. God takes responsibility for our hearts and minds. As we celebrate him and pray to him, he constructs a fortress around us, protecting us from the attacks of the devil. Paul had firsthand knowledge of this kind of peace and protection from God, for he had also endured his share of perfect storms. He had learned to believe in God's sovereignty and, and trust his protection and rely on his mercy. Paul's past could have caused him to experience immense feelings of guilt that brought him anxiety and robbed him of peace. After all, he had orchestrated the deaths of Christians. He was an ancient version of a terrorist, taking believers into custody and then spilling their blood. He was also a legalist to the core. Before he knew Christ, he had spent a lifetime trying to save himself. His salvation depended upon his perfection, on his performance. But then came the Damascus Road moment. Jesus appeared. And once Paul saw Jesus, he couldn't see anymore. He couldn't see any more value in his resume. He couldn't see any more merit in his merits, worth in his good works. He couldn't see any more reasons to boast about anything he had done. And he couldn't see any option except to spend the rest of his life talking less about himself and more about Jesus. He became the great poet of grace. But all these things that I once thought very worthwhile, now I've thrown them all away so that I can put my trust and hope in Christ alone. And in exchange for self-salvation, God gave Paul righteousness. Now I am right with God, not because I followed the law, but because I believed in Christ. Paul gave his past to Jesus, period. He surrendered it all to Christ, as a result, he would write, I'm still not all I should be, but I am bringing all my energies to bear on this one thing, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. I strain to reach the end of the race and receive the prize for which God is calling us up to heaven because of what Jesus did for us. Paul knew what it meant to face the end of the race. When he penned these famous words to the Philippians, he had endured his own perfect storm on the Mediterranean Sea. On his final voyage, Paul had been placed on a ship in Caesarea, destined for Italy. Sometimes prisoners were on the ship, presumably 
condemned men who were bound for the Roman arena. The ship enjoyed smooth sailing until they reached Sidon, where they changed vessels. They reached nearby Sinaitis with great difficulty. From there, they sailed south under the shelter of Crete until they reached the port of Fair Havens, about halfway along the island. Now, Fair Havens was not fair on the eyes. It received this name from the Chamber of Commerce, I suppose, in hope of attracting business. The sailors didn't want to stay there. They knew they couldn't reach Rome before winter, but they preferred the port of Phoenix. Paul tried to convince them otherwise. By this time, he was a seasoned seafarer. He knew the danger of a winter voyage. But in the eyes of the captain, Paul was nothing but a Jewish preacher. So they weighed anchor and set sail. But not long after, a tempestuous headwind arose called Eurocliden. What a great word. It's a compound of the Greek term euros, the east wind, and the Latin word aquilo, the north wind. The temperature dropped, the sails whipped, the waves frothed. The sailors searched for land and they couldn't see it. They looked at the storm and they couldn't avoid it. The components of the perfect storm were gathering. Individually, these elements were manageable but collectively they were formidable. The crew hoisted the lifeboat aboard and frapped the vessel. They lowered the sea anchor, jettisoned the cargo. They threw equipment overboard, but nothing worked. Now when neither sun nor stars appeared for many days and no small tempest beat on us, all hope that we would be saved was finally given up. The perfect storm took its toll. The disciples weathered the storm on the Sea of Galilee for nine hours. The crew on Paul's ship weathered their storm for 14 days. Nine hours would be enough. But two weeks of sunless days, bouncing and climbing toward the heavens, then plunging toward the sea, the sailors lost all reason for hope. They gave up, just like Tom did. Perhaps you're in the same place. You're bouncing about in a northeaster and have done all you can do to survive. You've tightened the ship, lowered the anchor, consulted the bank, changed your diet, called the lawyers, tightened your budget. You've gone for counseling, rehab, or therapy. Yet the sea churns with angry foam, and you're too worn out to fight anymore. You're ready to let the storm sweep you away. If that fear is coming at you from all sides, hear God's voice today. Let him speak to you just as he did at that moment to the sailors. Paul stood in the midst of them and said, Men, you should have listened to me and not have sailed from Crete and incurred this disaster and loss. And now I urge you to take heart, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. Notice, Paul began with a rebuke. The sailors were in this crisis because they didn't listen to him. Like many of us, they were in the middle of a storm of their own making. But while Paul's initial words contain a rebuke, he goes on to relate three crucial promises that can give us peace. First, we can know that during any storm, heaven has helpers to help us. Paul said to the men, there stood by me this night an angel. On the deck of a sinking ship in a raging storm, Paul received a visitor from heaven. Remember, this visit came 14 days after the storm had started. 14 days of silent but stormy skies. Perhaps you can relate. Have you prayed and heard nothing? Are you floundering in the land between an offered and answered prayer? Do you feel the press of Satan's mortar and pestle? If so, don't give up. Know that you have been heard in heaven. Angelic armies have been dispatched. Reinforcements have been rallied. God promises, I will contend with him who contends with you. Remain before the Lord. For those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. And they shall mount up with wings like eagles, and they shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not be faint. 
A second promise we can grasp in the middle of a storm is that heaven has a place for us. Paul said, There stood by me this night an angel of the God to whom I belong. Paul knew that he belonged to God, for he had given his life to him. And he knew that when he gave his life to God, the Lord took responsibility of him. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. He also instructed, do not call anyone on earth father, for you have one father and he is in heaven. You are God's child and he is your father. So we can have peace in the midst of the storm. Because first, we're not alone. Second, we belong to God. And third, we are in the Lord's service. Paul said to the crew, For there stood by me this night an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I serve. The Lord had given Paul the assignment of carrying the gospel to Rome. Paul had not yet arrived there, so God was not yet finished with him. Paul knew he would survive. Now, most of us don't have a clear message like Paul's, but we do have the assurance that we will not live one day less than we are supposed to live. If God has work for us to do, he will keep us alive to do it. This is not to say we won't have problems. Paul had his share as evidenced by what he said next. Now, I urge you to take heart, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. It's not easy to lose your ship. It's not easy to part with the vessel that has kept you afloat. Without it, you fear you will sink. And you will. For a while, waves will sweep over you. Anxiety will suck you under. But take heart, says Paul. Take heart, says Christ. In this world, you will have trouble. But be brave. I have defeated the world. You know you can lose it all, only to discover that you haven't. God has been there all along. God has never promised a life without storms, but he has promised to be there when you face them. The theologian Henry Nouwen once wrote about a lesson of trust he learned from a family of trapeze artists known as the Rodleys. He visited with them for a time, watching them fly through the air. When he asked one of them the secret of their art, the acrobat replied, when I fly, I have simply to stretch out my arms and hands and wait for my catcher to catch me and pull me safely over the apron. A flyer must fly and a catcher must catch and the flyer must trust with outstretched arms that his catcher will be there for him. In the great trapeze act of life, God is the catcher and we are the flyers. We trust period. We rely solely on God's ability to catch us. And as we do, a wonderful thing happens. We fly. Our Father has never dropped anyone. His grip is sturdy and his hands are open. Paul recognized this and it led him to declare, I know the Lord will continue to rescue me from every trip, trap, snare, and pitfall of evil and carry me safely to his heavenly kingdom. As Tom waited for the orderly to arrive, he felt just like that trapeze artist flying in the air with no net in sight to catch him. His mind raced from one anxious thought about the outcome to the next. But just then, a sound coming close by caught his attention. He had been sharing the pre-op room with another patient a small boy who was also undergoing a procedure. The boy's mother had come into the room and was reading him a story. Her words brought back a time in Tom's life when his mother would read stories to him. Every night as she tucked him into bed without fail, she would ask him to share his worries and concerns. Then she would pray with Tom and ask God to give him the strength and peace to overcome those fears. Tom also remembered that his mom always ended these prayers with a promise. Tommy, you don't need to worry. You're safe. God has you in his arms. Tom heard a noise at the front of the room and saw that the orderly had arrived. He took in a deep breath and repeated those words his mom had said to him. You don't need to worry. You're safe. God has you in his arms. 
In that moment, Tom chose to let God be the great catcher. He chose to cling to God. He chose to receive the peace that God was offering to him. In this world, you will have trouble. But in the midst of that trouble, God will extend his arms. He will send his angels. He will catch you and carry you in his arms. When you belong to him, you can have peace in the midst of the storm. The same Jesus who sent the angel to Paul sends this message to you. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. So if today you find yourself in the midst of a perfect storm, know that Jesus can offer you his perfect peace. Choose to place yourself entirely in his care. As you do, you will find it possible, yes, possible, to be anxious for nothing. Thank mm-hmm. you.